So hi everyone and welcome to today's lunchtime lecture as part of the Stories about Sustainability series this autumn. Um, the series invites architects from around the world to look back to the materiality and craft of the past and see how it can inform more sustainable building practices now and in the future. Uh, my name is Manishay Verghese and I'm the Head of Public Engagement here at the AA and I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, Chilean architect and urbanist Felipe Vera, who has written and lectured extensively on issues about urban design and planning, migration, inequity, climate fragility and ecology in vulnerable and informal contexts in Latin America. Today, he'll discuss how the climate crisis has escalated inequalities as the most vulnerable groups resort to informal settlements in areas with the greatest exposure to the effects of environmental hazards. Specifically in Argentina over the past five years, the number of informal settlements has seen a 25% increase from about 4,000 to 5,000. So in this lecture, he'll describe the ecological infrastructure needed to integrate vulnerable settlements into the formal city. His presentation will be followed by a conversation with co-directors of the A Ground Lab, Jose Alfredo Ramirez and Clara Oloriz San Juan, who both also teach on the AA Landscape Urbanism Program and whose research has also focused on climatic migration and informal settlements in Latin America. So, um, but for now, I am please join me in welcoming Felipe to the AA, at least the virtual AA. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you to the AA. Thank you to... Uh... Manje, thank you, Alfredo and Clara. It's really a pleasure to uh, share with you today uh, the work we have been doing, especially I'm going to uh, what, talk about the work that we have been developing in Latin America with Clara and Alfredo for several years. I wanted to, before, just, before starting, I wanted to check that you all see my screen and that you hear me okay. Yep. Is that cool? Yep, it looks good. Okay, great. So um, I'm going to speak fast. I have many things to speak about, um, uh, but uh, stay tuned and try to try to follow what I'm about to say because there are several things that I believe are important to discuss in order to um, have a great discussion afterwards. So I'm going to speak about something that we are calling Latin American transition, which is uh, the issue that while the urban world is facing a moment of growing uncertainty, Latin America is particularly uh, deep into this process. And I'm going to refer to three things, three things that we have been working closely with Ground Lab and closely with the AA uh, during the last five years. Um, I'm, I'm particularly grateful of the fruitful uh, collaboration and intellectual engagement that we have had with both Clara and, and Alfredo, and that, that's why this talk is so close to my heart. So uh, I believe that this level of uncertainty, and this is what I'm, I want to unfold throughout the lecture, um, mainly uh, relates to three things uh, that we will uh, uh, discuss one after the other. One is significant growth, the other is migration and the intensification of vulnerable interregional inter migration in Latin America and climate. And I'm going to, while this is a worldwide uh, phenomena, I'm going to speak mostly about uh, Latin America because it's a context that I know the best. First, in even growth, we know that the world population is 7.5 billion people. Uh, but if we project this towards the future, we realize that towards 2050, there are going to, to be uh, 2.5 billion people still to be built, meaning that the 25% of cities are still to be constructed. Um, what, what happened is that when we cross that number with where the cities are going to be constructed, we realize that this is going to happen within the, globe, the, the world of the majority, not in the US, not in Europe. It's going to happen in like, China, Asia, Africa, um, Latin America. And this is a map that what's showing is how many cities in 20, how many people cities are going to be absorbing in 2030. Also, if we match that map with the map showing where informal settlements are today, we realize that also the growth is going to happen in the geographies where more people are living in conditions of informality. Uh, and especially in Latin America, which is a country that, uh, which is a region that didn't have uh, a growth uh, in, in a long period of time as, as Europe had. Uh, actually, urbanization happened between 1950 and, and, and today at a very high rate, arriving from 1960 to today, from 26 to, to the 80 percent of people living in urban areas, uh, leaving many uh, city struggles and many people living in informal settlements at a level in which um, today, uh, while the world 
uh, the 30% of the world lives in conditions of informality, which is something that we don't, maybe we don't have this in mind uh, usually. Uh, in Latin America, one of uh, five people live uh, under these conditions, no? So the governments that I work with, because I have, I, I, I teach at the Harvard GSD, but at the same time, I work in a development bank, uh, dealing with governments and trying to provide solutions uh, for development problems. Uh, these are the landscapes and contexts that we uh, have to deal uh, um, every day. And these are like our domains of interventions, if you want. This is a very important number. Today, we're at a stage in which um, uh, in the region, in Latin America, 17,500 people move to the formal city, to an informal city every day, meaning that we have an unbalanced equation because what we should be ha having is um, uh, uh, a reduction of the stock of people living in informal settlements, but actually what we are having is, a, is, a, is an increase. The second, which is something that we have uh, close workly, uh, work closely with uh, Alfredo and Clara, is the, the intensification of migration. And many of the drawings and the things you will see here are, are being produced by, by Ground Lab, and you can download them from the publications that you will be looking um, in the here, which are public and, and easy to download from the IDB website. So while, while uh, 1 million people leave, uh, like migrate in the world, uh, 250 million people uh, are become international migrants, meaning that they cross borders. Um, and actually migration has intensified. So these 250 million people are about to become 350 million people towards 2050. It means 100 additional migrants to the, to the flag. So we have like a word in flags, we have more people moving. And the reason why we have more people moving is because um, people are more and more not able to stay in the places in which they belong, no? Uh, and this is configuring something that we are calling a landscape of vulnerable migration, um, which is called causing that migration is changing in nature and, and becoming more and more an un unpredictable process. Uh, something that is posing many problems to cities that are not able, cities that are not able to um, uh, prepare for this uh, condition, no? So at least in Latin America, migration used to be extra regional people coming from Europe and now became inter-regional, uh, used to be aspirational, people looking for opportunities and job and became uh, forced, used to be incremental. So uh, small trickles of migrants and, and, and suddenly it became sudden, like many people uh, moving from, from one day to the other. Uh, it used to be permanent. People used to come to Latin America to stay, but it became now reversible. People come and then they leave. So they stress services and cities and infrastructure. And suddenly uh, the, the, the conditions change and the driver of migration disappear and they, they go back to their countries of origin. And something which is also complicating the things the most is um, that it moved from being a, a migration of mature people, like mostly like full families or men that were migrating and sending remittances to their countries to, to a young migration, highly feminized. Latin America, uh, in Lat this, is a, this is a worldwide, uh, as I was saying, uh, condition, but that in Latin America and the Caribbean has intensified even more. After 1990, many events uh, changed the, the migration landscape in Latin America. Uh, and this is a timeline in which what we have done is um, looking at, at, at what was happening historically in, in the region and try to match uh, changes in migration uh, with uh, or, or, or big migration flows with the driver of migration. And what we have realized here and that, that more and more the drivers of migration since uh, 1990 and after became economical crisis, natural disasters, poverty and jobs, uh, and again, economical crisis. So, so uh, political instabilities, uh, violence, like, like many, many conditions that are not at all aspirational, that are, that are um, uh, triggers or, or, or of displacement. So migration and emigration, as I said, became a more unpredictable process. And what we have seen, what we can see here in these, these drawings uh, that Clara and Alfred also uh, did uh, is exactly that intensification. What happened uh, from 1990 towards uh, 2020, um, 
in the in the emigration stock in the region uh, and we can we can cross that with uh, if we look at the when the curve changes we can we can literally understand what are the triggers of those uh, or the drivers of those migrations and of course this has a counterpart of where, when people leave a country where they go where they go no and 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 there are some countries that particularly became uh, the, the absorbers of these migration uh, fluxes, which because of reasons of proximity, soft, like borders that were more soft and economic prosperity. In three decades, uh, this process really created an intra-regional uh, migration network uh, across the Latin American region. Um, I, I won't stop here. These are a series of map. Uh, showing uh, recent numbers uh, and, and a way why people were moving at a certain moment. They're like, as you know, hurricanes, uh, uh, natural disasters, uh, employment reasons. The case of Venezuela, which is crazy, where a country of 21 million people uh, lost, lost uh, 7 million people uh, in, let's say, three years. Uh, and actually, what is even more crazy and, and shows also this idea of reversibility in migration is that Venezuela used to be an absorbent of migrants, used to used to be a a a, a, pool, a pulling country, and suddenly it became a pushing country um, because of of the changing condition. Actually, many people from Colombia, because of of the of the guerrillas and, and violence, uh, used to be uh, migrating to uh, uh, Venezuela, uh, and in a very let's say violent condition with lots of deaths. Uh, uh, but from one day, particularly from one day to the other, people just walking from the, uh, the walking the frontier from one border uh, to the other, uh, just uh, conditions change, you know. And numbers are are really crazy when we when we look at them. And this is not this is not a specific thing to Venezuela. It's happening all over the world. It's happening with things that we will see most and most, like the deforestation on the Amazonia, that is also pushing people away from uh, natural and biodiverse uh, spaces throughout the continent. Um, uh, natural disasters as what has happened in Haiti, um, uh, and, and also violence as it happened in the Northern Triangle of uh, Guatemala, Sondura, Nicaragua, where migration is particularly uh, let's say terrific and and hard and and violent with women that go to uh, that go to uh, the U.S. Uh, if we move this uh, flax conversation towards urban design, we real we realize that the the result at the geographical level is a constellation of cities that are part of a very robust migration uh, network uh, that many times are neglected by governments. No, there are many pathways, as we can see here, of people moving from one country to the other. Uh, but also these several pathways has have um, uh, created a, a network of cities uh, that we have um, uh, organized in taxonomies that are uh, in four taxonomies. So one is origin cities, uh, so pushing cities, there are small population expellers, uh, then border cities, cities in the in the frontiers, as the case of Tijuana and many others that that are adjacent to borders, but also many times are places uh, very harsh in terms of commercial and human exchange, violence, uh, insecurity, um, and then transit cities, where it's normally where people arrive, um, uh, but 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 cities that that are, are maybe softer and easy to to get into, but they they don't want to stay there. Migrants are really looking for destination cities, um, and destination cities tend to be big mega cities, metropolitan areas with economic opportunities. And what we have been realizing is that these people are normally uh, then feeding informal settlements, which is what we are going to see to see now. What I want to say is that we have this networks of paths, then we have these agglomerations of cities that, that are changing also the infrastructure and there are lots of, um, let's say, buildings, uh, infra uh, um, built uh, uh, infrastructure that are accommodating migrants, uh, but there is also um, but there is also many relationships relationships between between cities uh, and, and this is something that I believe won't stop. 
mainly because uh, when we look at numbers, the reason why these people migrate is not only because they cannot stay in their countries of origin, but also because they leave their families in the places where they belong. No, for instance, the big, the twenty percent of Haiti GDP comes from remittances, and remittances from the two thousand to two thousand eighteen have grown from uh, one hundred twenty six to six. Uh, 128 billion uh, dollars, which just what this is saying is that we have a, a world in flux, but we also has uh, lots of threats in economy that are um, uh, like connecting migration. The case of Chile is particularly interesting. Chile was a country that used to have only 62,000 migrants in 1990, but in 1921, the number grew to 1 million 400. Uh, thousand migrants. So migration multiplied by 23, 23 times more is what they had, becoming also not only, uh, it's not a big stock of migrants, but it's the most accelerated one, but also the most diverse one in the whole in the whole region. And this is what I was mentioning before. So the counterpart of this, because we are looking not at aspirational migration, but we are looking at um, at um, forced migration, uh, what this is hap what this is doing is that in 2011, the people living in informal settlements was only uh, that were migrants was only the one percent. In 19 in 2019, it was a 30 percent, and in 2021, it was a 42 percent. Arriving in the north of Chile to have lots of informal settlements that has um, today 80 or 90 percent of people that are migrants when you have to give housing and think of public policy this really changes the rule of game um so it, it's it's a very complicated issue that we need to address in a sort in a sort of way because a gradual trickle of migrants might get absorbed by communities in, in a very easy way but when you have a rapid influx of southerns refugees as we have seen all over the world uh, and we see this more and more with the war and 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 and, and all of that um this generate many reactions from the existing communities which is also the social fabric became something that is complicated to manage and to deal this brings me to the other topic which is we have seen a, like um uh population growth and urbanization then migration which is, which is this uh, like condition of flux and now the third thing is is how this is going to shift from a migration and a flux that used that has like all the drivers that I mentioned towards more and more drivers that are related to climate. Um, in 2020, 42 million people were displaced due to environmental causes um, that accounts for the 10% of the global migration. And it's estimated that by 2050, this figure will increase, increase to 2,000 to 200 million. So 60% of all migration won't be because of natural display, displacement, but will be related to the effects of climate change in any sort of way. As we speak, every second, a new migrant is forced uh, into displacement due to natural disaster or environmental crisis. So this brought me uh, to my the third topic or the, the third axis of transformation, which is, well, we all know that cities are centers of prosperity, wealth, and, and innovation, um, and and but they're also the main responsible for the climatic crisis. No, um, this is just a map showing uh, emissions. We have also these all these other series of books uh, that are called ecological design that you can download and see all this information in much more detail. But the world is getting warmer and warmer, and and I like this installation by Olaf Eliasson saying that we are doing all this effort by like to mitigate the effects of climate change, but actually climate change already arrived. It's inside inside buildings, and now the big agenda should be adaptation. And I like also this uh, conceptual framework that Paul Virilio gave us in saying that uh, like the progress and the catastrophe are in a way both sides of the same coin. And what we have to do is modulating change and the velocity and this tension between being patient and the acceleration and the anxiety of having a, a progress that is like moving um, uh, in a very uh, rapid pace is, is, is taking us into, into, into something that we could call like catastrophe. And we see this in, in, the, in the current political, high level political discussion, which is the anxiety of putting most of the efforts in resisting, preserving, and then mitigating. Whereas what we have to do today when the sun is already inside the buildings, uh, trying to modulate change. And this is a design challenge. This is something that has to be achieved uh, uh, through architecture, urban design planning, but mostly through landscape. 
actually I believe that landscape is going to be the um, the discipline uh, for the next uh, few years in the in the climatic action and the contention and the adaptation of climate change. And just to give you some numbers, three out of five cities with more of 500,000 inhabitants today are at risk of suffering a natural disaster. And this is crazy when we think, when we think of just transition because the 1% of the world own the 44% of the world wealth, whereas the, the 58 of the poorest on only the 2% of the world wealth. And, and this, when we look at this level of inequality and then we look at cities, we realize that also this has a counterpart in emissions because cities that are em emitting the, the least have the most, uh, are exposed to the biggest climatic hazards, at least in Latin America and in the region. Um, when we look at projections, it, the, the, the conversation becomes even more complicated uh, because um, uh, projections indicate that climate change will increase the risk of people, resor resources, and ecosystem, but mostly of those that are living in informal settlements. When we look at things like sea temperature, and these are uh, like a series of maps, and I don't know, if, sorry, because they're very subtle, but showing how like um, sea temperature, heat waves, and maybe many, many other factors are really be responsible for most of the displacement. So this is where uh, population growth, migration, and climate change start to threat. Uh, for instance, 1.6 billion people will face conditions of, of sustained stream heat. Um, and, and from those, um, uh, 215 million will live uh, in poverty. No, well, Then sea level rise, this is also something that it, I believe it's it's really powerful when we think that 90% of urban sprawl in developing countries take place near as and as are prone areas, uh, and most of informal settlements that are actually being built in zones that are going to be underwater. Extreme rainfall, so uh, it's not it's not that it's going to rain much more. It's going to rain in in shorter period of time, but in extreme conditions, and and actually already. 9.3 million people uh, were displaced because of, of, of storm and 5.4 uh, million people are displaced because of flooding. Continuous droughts, uh, this is going to change patterns all over the world and, and 1.3 million of new displacement uh, in, 19, in, in 2017 were due to these droughts. And, and when we put all these, all these uh, changes together, actually what happens is that we can do some estimations uh, uh, of how, how are going to be the profound bioclimatic changes of cities. And this is very, very important. Uh, if we look at 727 cities in Latin America, we can realize that at like a not a small number, 592 um, uh, cities will experience a profound bioclimatic change. What I mean by doing this is that cities are belonging to several climatic zones, as this map shows. Uh, when we see what is happening in the climatic zones throughout uh, the years, uh, we realize that this is moving. And, uh, and, and that cities are, are, are like a city that used to be into one climatic zones suddenly will progressively be into another climatic zone. And, and what this means is that the, the whole infrastructure that is built for that city will need to adapt to the new climatic condition. And this is a design challenge and a design agenda. No, There are going to be three main axes of these uh, changes. One will be aridification, savanitization, and tropicalization. There are going to be 261 cities that are going to be desertified, 142 cities that are going to be tropicalized, and 259 cities that will be savanitized. Um, and also, if we look towards the future, uh, to 2,100 cities will be facing at least uh, six natural disasters at the same at the same time. So, what uh, the like the the agenda of resiliency, uh, what governments and the role of designers in this, which is what I'm about to speak, is really going to change uh, towards the future. Cities are doing many efforts, but actually precarious neighborhoods, as I was saying, uh, are like 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 really a way of the conversation, uh, which is a, a complicated thing. Um, 
and and I believe, and what I, what I would like to push or, or maybe lead with this talk and discuss afterward with um, uh, Alfredo and Clara, is that uh, I really believe that designers, we as designers, need to push a climatic and migratory inclusive agenda uh, if we want if we want to increase the agency of design. And I believe the agency of design moves into three different realms that probably are not the traditional ones that we will think when we think of design. And so these realms are uh, the technical, the political, and the theoretical. And in order to just um, explain a bit what, 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 I mean, what, I, what I mean by doing this, I will share part of what I've been doing in my practice. Um, so the first thing is that I believe designers really need to push the high level urban agenda towards the reactions of uh, these emergent, three emergence challenges that I'm, I'm saying. And, and what at least my contribution in this has been trying to um, change paradigms in Islamic grading programs. I manage a huge portfolio of investments in Latin America, like $2 billion um, that I have to negotiate with governments on and on to say, how, what do we do with informal settlements? And I want to show you very quickly what was the what was the idea in informal settlements and what we are doing today in this like timeline of what was the past, the present, and the future. Uh, and I'm going to speak about three paradigms and one that's still yet to be developed. And for doing this, I'm going to briefly refer to three countries. One is Chile, then Brazil, and then Argentina. Um, so uh, in the 60s, uh, the, 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 the paradigm was uh, in terms of uh, neighborhood upgrading, so meaning converting an slum into a part of the city was the eradication because the conceptualization of the problem was in, in inequality, was uh, illegality. So Chile was a pioneer on this. Uh, Chile had in the 50s uh, a huge uh, uh, migration from uh, rural to urban, uh, to rural to cities. And because of that, uh, under the um, socialist government of Salvador Allende, they, they had this operation Sitio but that was highly promoted by the, the World Bank, uh, by in which they will they will uh, just give a plot of land with a unit of basic services to to families, um, and uh, and they will they will um, uh, uh, and and this this was like a huge operation in in eradication. Um, but as you know, uh, and this was in a way uh, a manner to give land to people within the city, um, help them uh, help popular neighborhoods to get access to land. Uh, but then we had a military coup and that military coup really changed completely uh, in like the, the economical matrix into a more neoliberal one. And that was in, in the 1973. So in 1979, uh, all the public policy in Chile start changing and then the eradication paradigm uh, that then was also emulated by many countries started uh, to follow. This is part of the work that uh, Alejandra Celedon show in the Venice Biennale, I think four Venice Biennales ago, which is a research showing uh, uh, the, the most, like the biggest bureaucratic operation of displacement. Um, this is the National Stadium of Chile, but we are not looking at a soccer uh, game. What we are looking here is, um, is, a, is, a, is a, a massive bureaucratic operation by which they were giving to all these people living within the city next to opportunities, uh, a plot of land. So they were all becoming owners. This was orchestrated by the Ministry of Housing under the leadership of um, the military and in particularly the leadership of uh, uh, Augusto Pinochet, that was the dictatorship in Chile. Um, so it, uh, it will appear in the neighborhoods with the with the stadium in the middle. It's it's quite crazy, but actually uh, it, uh, there was uh, there was thirty seven thousand people that were given that day one piece of land of their their own. Uh, uh, this is the dictatorship, like saying hi to everybody and welcoming them as new owners of a house. Uh, but what nobody said by that time is the location of that uh, uh, those pieces of land that were in the outskirts of the city no uh, I, I i like what art did in that moment which was at the same time well while, while the government was giving to everybody um some uh, pieces of land art started to uh, put this this um uh, conversation about 
starving, no starvation, and they use milk as their imagination. So what they did was using and putting milk in art galleries, uh, giving that to people, uh, doing performances. So, so this is the entrance of the Museum of Art, uh, National Art in Chile, uh, covered by the white, almost milk kind of uh, um, um, facade that was brought also in within inside milk uh, 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 tracks um, uh, saying that it is not enough to provide housing what we need to be to get is like means of living so then we had uh, uh, this transition the the a plebiscite uh, Chile didn't have like a post state dictatorship. What we had was a political transition based on consensus. So there was a perpetuation of the intervention model. Uh, for many years, uh, this generation and this map on the left, what shows is where these people from the stadium went, uh, actually draw a map. This is the income map of Chile. What you have here in the north, uh, in, the, in the upper part is the, so the blue is high income and then it's almost a perfect gradient towards the red where um, very, poor people live. And then when you cross that with the map on the right, which is where the people were, were brought uh, matches perfectly. Um, but the, the complication is that this happened like 30 years after. And there is a there is a perfect match in between the access to all different uh, city attributes. No? And what is this doing is that uh, people get trapped into poverty traps. And if you, we didn't study by which we measure um, the life expectancy if you were born in one part of the city or, or in the other, and the life expectancy really changes in 10 years, which is crazy. People get bored, uh, like 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 they were all pissed, really pissed off, and and be, with in in as you maybe you know in in nineteen um in, in twenty eighteen they went to the streets, they uh, started burning everything, every institutional um uh, like symbol. Uh, claiming for a more just condition. This is not at all something that is completely based on urban design and planning and housing, but I really like that there was this idea of Chile waking up, realizing that there was something that was not working while the, like, while, while the police was shooting people in their eyes. Um, but again, this idea of hunger appears in projections on the streets and then the idea of milk and then the idea that housing and then urban design and planning need to do more than just providing a, a home. So this brings me to the other paradigm, something that we have been doing in Argentina for many years. Uh, while Chile was doing that in Argentina and the other countries of the region, the, the assumption was that what we had to do was reducing the stock by formalizing uh, providing water, sanitation, electricity. So leave people where they were living and um, and programs will have a 95% of investment in infrastructure and a 5% of investment in social, um, in social, um, uh, uh, in, 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 in social things, no? Um, so there was all these series of programs in Brazil is one of the more, of, of the biggest uh, promoters of this, but also Argentina, Uruguay and Paraguay uh, that were eradication programs. People will stay where they live. They will, they, uh, and there will, there will be the assumption that what we need to do is uh, make the informal city to resemble to uh, the conditions of the informal city. The huge problem was what, what, that when we started evaluating these programs like 10 years after we did uh, the investments, uh, we realized that formalizing what was not enough. And it was not enough because even if people were staying in the same places they were living, they were still uh, having many income income traps, no? So distant, lack of food, poor of connectivity, and all of that. And and I like this graph, which is what is showing is that in political, in in public policy, what you need to do is to. Uh, so this is a this red line. What shows that you are if you are up if you are uh, up into this red line, uh, your your future income will be more than your current income. But if you are below. Uh, your income of the future is going to be less than your income of the present. So, so the so the work of public policy and the work of designers in this term is to push people up into this equation. So the model of formalization was incomplete. We needed to add something else, and what we what we needed to add was this idea of sustainability. How do we provide by providing housing? How do we provide um, sustainability? And this is where 
at least me and my team enter into the conversation. We designed several big programs uh, across uh, the region, mainly in Latin America. I will refer to only one of these ones, which is Barrio 31. That was, I will say, the inception of um, the of the program that was in the Economist last week. This um, this note saying that that this slam policy seems to be a right bright spot in the country. What we did here was saying so. Barrio 31 is the biggest and the and, and the greatest slam in in Argentina, but it's very in a very weird location because it's next to the most the wealthier part of the city. Uh, it's 4, 000, was 4,000 families when we started um, intervening, and this is how it looked like. Um, most of them are migrants as well. Um, and the numbers, when you compare it with uh, Buenos Aires, uh, with the rest of Buenos Aires are crazy. So, so really what we had to do was converting, or what the major wanted us to do, was converting this barrio into, with this villa, which is Islam, into a barrio. And, and what we said is that we won't do this in the same way that we have been doing this for the last 20 years. We would do this in a very different way. So the, the first symbolic thing that was done was actually turning down um, the, the place in which that was called the um, um, it was called the um, the house of Tarzan. Tarzan was the biggest uh, drug dealer in the neighborhood, and it was replaced by uh, a center for economic development. And in the second in the second floor, what we put was uh, the office of the major. So the major of the city will come to the slum to work twice, once a week, every Thursday. Uh, and the symbolic thing behind this was saying we will start by providing jobs, and we will bring political visibility to the slum. It's not that you have to resemble the formal city, it's that the formal city has to come to the slum. And, 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 and something else that we did was bringing the Ministry of Education to the center of the slum, creating the three uh, most uh, advanced schools, one for like kids, the other a high school, and the other for people that were not able to finish their, their um, their education, so adults. Um, the other thing we did was actually not providing housing by creating several, uh, this, this is house, housing as it was before, but it's not providing just housing or giving housing to people, but creating a program by which people will get trained to build their houses so they will get uh, materials and then get assistance and by doing that what you and and through this process they will get certified in many different uh, sorts of technical jobs that will allow them afterwards to enter into the economies and the ecologies of the construction market. So they will won't only get a house, which is always transferring a cost to people, they will get means of living by receiving the house. Then the other thing was, was just bringing a huge infrastructure. There was this like Ilia, this big um, highway that that uh, is dividing the neighborhood in two. Uh, so what we did was this huge competition. This is not yet built, but the aim was converting this highway and creating a bypass into a big part that will make city coming into the neighborhood. So it's also was creating spaces of contact, creating creating spaces by which. Uh, the exclusion and 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 the and the thresholds between the formal and the informal will get uh, in a way um, dissolved. No, and the final thing is that we needed to find a space for the IDB um, for the IDB uh, office, and we worked with Alejandro Aravena, and and this was the condition. So you know, as I was showing, you had like the slum, and then you have the city on the other side, and and it was very difficult to think of of. Uh, of an intervention, but what we realized was that maybe, and this was Alejandro's idea, uh, that maybe uh, we could do a building that more than a building could be a connection, like a symbolic connection between the city, the informal city and the formal city, and that will become more than an office, it will become uh, like a bridge uh, that uh, will allow uh, the city to have this huge um, public space and it will also complete a series of uh, other uh, green spaces, as you can see here, like this ring of um, biodiversity crossing across the region, crossing across the, the neighborhood. So also bringing many like bees and, and other uh, animals and, and not only flora, but also fauna that will help regenerating uh, within the neighborhood, uh, all, the, all the conditions. But what is most important here is the power of how transformative was that operation? Because in one hour time, even if we had spent here in this neighborhood $100 million for the upgrading, 
um, uh, in an hour in an hour time, people still had only um, access to three health operate three health uh, institutions like uh, and 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 what is more important only to three hundred uh, thousand jobs, whereas um, in um, uh, by creating this bridge, what you were doing, and and it's just one very cheap operation in regards to everything that we had um, invest in in the rest of the of the of the slum. Uh, we had uh, one. We, they had what, like access to one million three hundred uh, jobs. No, so so the issue of integration and bringing the opportunities to the to the informal city was uh, really important. After doing this project. We really changed. So, so this was a very small one hundred million dollar program. But uh, we are designing many others across the region. I'm, I'm, I, I designed one that was two hundred million, and then now I'm doing another which is one hundred fifty million. And what we did was changing completely the equation of investments. So, instead of investing ninety five percent into infrastructure, we start investing and five percent of social the equation was investing 65% into infrastructure and 35% of in, in multi-sectoral interventions. And this might seem and look something which is a very like, uh, like what an economist will be speaking about, but I'm a designer. And this is the result of a design process of a design uh, uh, rationale. And this is very important when, when, I, when I say that um, designers, we need to conquer space of power and we need to move the agenda of what is being done uh, in, 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 in by governments in terms of uh, huge and big decisions. And when we look toward the future, I believe that the, the, that the problem would be um, uh, adapting, no? So uh, like the problem was first eradicating, then uh, improving, then integrating, but towards climate change, the problem will be adapting. And for, for, for doing that, I will briefly share what we did in Chile. Chile had this huge, growth in informal settlements. We had a program there. Uh, so we financed $100 million and then we gave 20 million of donations and we gave a million and, and 200 with for um, for uh, knowledge. But that allows us that allowed us to complete this equation that I was showing before saying that it, it was not enough to reduce the stock. It was not enough to bring the sustainability. If you really want to balance this equation and stop with that number of uh, 17,000 uh, people moving from the informal city to the formal city, what we need to do is to contain the flags. But if we want to contain the flags, we need to uh, align um, the instrument countries have with the with what are the real challenges, these emerging challenges, which are migration, climate change, I will say gender and diversity. This is the other book that we that we wrote. And, uh, and we wrote it because we wanted to understand uh, if you want to do proper a political policy, what you have to do is to have the right tools and the information. So what we did was looking at where the information was coming and we realized that in every country was, there was a lot of disparity and information was coming from uh, census and, and other things. But so what we did was financing in um, in Chile, a new cadastre for informal settlements that was linked with this. This is something that was starting in Argentina, also with Clara and Alfredo. Um, that we then exported to Chile, um, which was the Atlas of Informal Settlements. Uh, it's an atlas uh, that um, uh, allows us to uh, measure the risk, but not only the actual risk, but the risk towards the future uh, that every single informal settlement will have. Uh, and this allows the government to give priority and to intervene to those that are today and that will be in the future more exposed to uh, informal settlements. And we did this not as a one-time thing. So what we created was a system by which the government today has a remote sensing uh, um, uh, system that uses um, uh, artificial intelligence to analyze the foot, the fingerprint of satellite imagery. imagery. Uh, so they have a viewer and with the viewer, what they do is like understanding what is happening in each neighborhood. And then we have this cadaster by which we we, we we I will say Chile has the most sophisticated um, survey applied um, to people living in informal settlements that talks about gender diversity, migration, and other things. And these are some of the drawings and some of the like the complexity of the information that you will never look into public policy documents. But this is what design is bringing back. It's like designing filtering the the agenda of, of governments in several in several things. 
Very quickly, I will tell you that I also believe that we as designers need to expose decision makers into design solutions. So what we also, because you know that like this is power Paris agreement that is an agreement between ministers, ministers of finance and ministers of environment. Um, but really, uh, even if all of this is achieved, which is all the mitigation agenda that I was mentioning before, the world will be anyway a disaster. So the the the, the real the real challenge is this vertical integration. That is, how do we move from country to city, and and this is how do we create projects? How do we create good projects uh, that then majors and cities can implement? So we had C40. C40 was a space in which we want we wanted to do was making design, speaking with politics. Um, I, I, I was part of the of the organization of, of our contribution to C40. This is the major of Argentina. What we did was actually unpacking this book uh, that that uh, we we recently published about um, ecological design into a big exhibition, an exhibition that will show all the information about um, uh, data, voices, and design solutions. So those are cases. Uh, uh, so we had uh, 40 interviews, uh, Clara and Alfredo were always in, uh, there um, uh, speaking to all these people, and then we brought 30 projects of Islam, of Islam upgrading programs that had been uh, uh, like um, effective in improving, restoring, anticipating, mitigating, connecting, and adapting uh, the urban environment. Um, and what is the most interesting thing is that we put together like 30 or 40 majors to speak and discuss the whole day about design and how design could uh, be a tool for them to speak with their constituencies and then also be effective in adapting to climate change. So also we had like this big exhibition in the room that was in a way like brainwashing every, all of these are majors brainwashing their heads uh, and making them speak about uh, what is uh, what was um, uh, the agenda. And just to finish, I believe that there is in terms of the theoretical agenda, um, I think it's more and more important that we need to bridge the gap between um, the visions that uh, academia can provide and the implementation that happens in practice. This, many times in academia, we think about fantastic things, and then in practice, uh, practitioners are really into execution, and there is a gap by which there are not conversation between these these both things. And I believe everyone that is in this in this uh, conversation has certain agency in in changing this. I've been trying to do this here at the Harvard GSD by teaching a series of seminars and 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 studios uh, that have focused always or with the strategy of having a real client. So what we do is taking one client that is actually doing a transformation. We see what are their pains and we, we help them providing solutions that push the agenda one step uh, ahead. No, uh, And, and I, I, I tend to bring students and, and have them spend a lot of time with those that are taking decisions on the ground. And then we bring them back to the GSD to show the results. And there is a fruitful conversation between what between those that need that have the anxiety of getting results with the others that have the vision and the space to um to create and generate imagination. So in a way, is it, it, the perfect format for uh, designing a grounded vision, no? And, and just to end, I wanted to uh, give you an inspiration of what I believe could be a, a series of, of cities that we should be looking at if we want to um, understand what, uh, like, what could be an alternative um, modality for designing a more flexible and adaptive city for the, for the future. So 10 years ago, we, we wrote this book with uh, Rahul Merotra, which is a book about uh, a city that I, 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 I had the pleasure to document in India that every 10 year, every um, 12 years happens at, so this is uh, the, the encounter of the Ganges and the Jamuna. Uh, every 12 years, uh, 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 these um, many people come to this city, to this space, uh, because they believe that if they bath, in, in, in this river, they will get free from reincarnation. This is an image I took from one, uh, from the places in which uh, we were living. But what what is related to what I'm speaking about is that this same image, uh, then three months afterwards, uh, actually looked like this. So uh, a full, complete, completely functional city with 100 
uh, 85 kilometers of uh, streets and 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 hospitals and 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 many and and all the infrastructures and and gadgets and devices of a city was really assembled in a very short period of time um uh uh, this is how it looks like it looks like um, it's a city that is very interesting in the way in, in which it's assembled it receives 120 million people in in rounds of 20 millions that that come for for these sacred baths um, and what is interesting are the principles that are behind this city because it's a city that is actually made out of cities of materials that um, are assembled but not that they're not they don't get transformed so just they're they just combinations of materials uh, that then get disassembled and reabsorbed completely by the ecologies of construction everything can be uh, designed and moved by two or three people has like uh, principles of incrementality on reutilization and and also what is very interesting is that is also a city that is reversible. When we think of climate change and we think of migration and we think of all, of, all these things that are, are really challenging the notion of permanence as a basic condition of city, really challenging, challenging everything that we inherit theoretically from the modern movement, uh, looking at examples like these ones should be very inspirational. Actually, it's very nice because after the event, uh, ends which is only 55 days then the river come river comes and wash everything away and then uh the 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 plots of land become uh, crops no so it's a refunctionalization and so based on that we we wrote a series of books um with uh the idea of seeing if there were more cities like this one we realized that actually the world is plain of ephemeral cities from which which we can learn many principles and things. We had this pavilion at the Venice Biennale um, a couple of Biennales ago, where we were showing that at least uh, 600 cities and 700 million people used to occupy transitional spaces like markets, uh, military camps, or um, uh, uh, big celebrations and uh, or others. Um, and, and when we think that the future of Latin American cities would be a future of climatic adaptation, uh, migration absorption, and the growth of informality, I really believe that if we want to create and work towards uh, the new imaginations, uh, a new imagination for design, that is more effective in our practice and is more effective on adapting to a world that is in flux and that has this level of uncertainty, uh, issues like light and lightness, weakness, agility, flexibility, and reversibility, which are in a way, again, uh, concepts and ideas that, that really challenge what we inherit uh, from the modern movement, which is in a way at the very basic, even if we don't say it every day, at the very basic of the assumptions we have when we, when we move into design, it's it's of highly importance. So that's what I had to share with you today. And thank you very much for for listening. Wow, Felipe. Uh, thank you very much for all of this story and this um trajectory from uh migration to the informal cities, but also forms of governance policies. It's been um really, really interesting. Um I like to add that um because we've collaborated for a long time now with the AA Ground Lab team that uh is not just a uh, Alfredo and myself. They are like uh there's other people around that I see in the in in this conversation as well, to name a few, Carlota Olivari, Daniel Keys, Lena Luciano. So I think it's they are a very important part of, of the team as well. So before starting with the questions. Um just to uh, repeat uh, Manille's uh, uh, words at the beginning, we'll pose some questions to Felipe, Alfred, and myself, and then we will open it to the audience. So if you want to put your questions in the chat, please uh, do so. And uh, I think there's, um, there's the, the bad thing about working <laughs> with you for such a long time is that most of the questions that I had prepared, you've already covered them. <laughs> So, so maybe I'm going to ask you, um, because you mentioned that for you, the future is in the landscape and that uh, in the following decades, landscape is going to play a very important role. But um, there are still all of these um, institutional and, and disciplinar barriers, you know? like even in the way um, you've presented some of the projects because you were from a 
from let's say a department that focuses on cities like is is difficult to bridge those um those like disciplinary or institutional and even like budget related no um uh, projects that focus on cities because the the urban age discourse has been so successful in convincing that cities are the most like efficient um and sustainable places uh, to to focus on that uh, most of the policies and budgets tend to focus on cities and this makes invisible like all the landscapes in which cities sit but also on which they depend so if landscape is to play this very important role how do you think um we can start like making these links visible between cities and landscape these dependencies these uh responsibilities how how do we start viewing cities and imagining cities differently Oh well, that I think that's a fantastic like uh, question because uh, allowed us to really reflect a bit historically. No, I, I believe that when the challenge was building cities, so like people moving from rural to the urban, then there was a predominance of architecture as a discipline. Then, uh, then we already had cities, and the issue was how do we organize this mess? And and then is where uh, the predominance in the discussion it's actually urban planning and design uh, and then planners and designers got the power like thinking of the modern move movement and all of that uh, i believe that we're in a moment of transition in which with the effects of climate change and environmental uncertainty what is going to happen is that the toolkit to address all of this is not is not relying neither in architecture need in urban planning and design is it's it's a toolkit that belongs to landscape so there what what we need to do is to translate and probably create more more uh contact zones in between the repertoire the instrument repertoire that landscape has into those um uh operations and 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 that's why i i i try to frame this into like this um technical um, political and theoretical, because I think these are three agendas that we need to really push forward if we want to situate landscape. Because as as if we do this in a in a quick way, we're going to be effective to prepare cities to all these challenges. And I see this more and more because I I, I because of the position I'm, I occupy um, at, at the at the bank, uh, I, I I tend to sit often with ministers and 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 majors and all of that and i tend to see more and more an interest of understanding so how do i green my city again and then greening a city is actually not bringing plants it's like bringing fauna and then it has to do with bees and like there is all a much more complicated ecological view uh, that is difficult for people that has been for many years used to listening about bricks and streets and and cars to start speaking about squirrels and 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 trees and fruits and seeds um and so 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 i think it's something that i mean there is an anxiety of uh, empowering and, and providing agency to landscape i believe that is something that that is really inevitable what we have to do and i like what you do at the aea uh, in the sense like through the uh, through the program that you're leading, um, uh, which is uh, preparing or adapting a set of tools for being effective in, in, in intervening. And, 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 and that's why I'm so grateful, grateful with you and your team, because it has been for me as somebody that sit, sits in the, in the chair of, that normally not a designer, but an economist will, will occupy. Um, uh, how do I say this? Um, uh, an instrument for translation to uh, bring uh, people uh, to, to to really being effective to close that gap and to uh, enlarge the agency of um, landscape uh, for this incoming agenda. But it's something that is going to happen. I think your programs like yours are the programs that are going to get prominence in a near future. Thanks, Felipe. Yeah, I, for the presentation again, I think it's yeah, very comprehensive presentation of all the research you have developed in the last uh, 
years, no? So that's something that obviously we saw today, you know, a snapshot of that amount of work that you guys have been producing and also well, part of the work that we, uh, as part of the AA, have been producing and collaborating. No? So I think that's very important for us and I guess also for, you know, the students, the student community that can see how, you know, academy can be linked to some of the decisions that have been taken. I have one uh, question uh, that uh, it seems that, uh, well, my, my, my original question was like, you know, uh, some of the work that you uh, produce, it's, uh, you know, migrations, which is people going from A to B. No. And usually the solutions that are being provided are in B. Uh, now I, I can see also, you know, that you talk about reversibility, no, and and, and there might be that, you know, the solution might be applicable to A, uh, but it seems that you know A and B are always uh, cities, and I don't know whether you know that if you think uh, whether your team or whether the department can also focus in in, in that are not cities, no? like what would be the role of you know policies or design, uh, you know, solutions where a uh, agriculture or a, a rural environment can actually be uh, also benefited by this. So uh, perhaps uh, uh, you also foster the idea that perhaps uh, migration doesn't necessarily need to happen by improving the areas where people are actually coming from. No? So uh, is there a scope for that as well within this or is only kind of uh, cities uh, the, the goal. Yeah, no, absolutely. The um, actually, what happened is that you are speaking with me. And the, so the bank, the bank is organized as in the same way in which governments are, are organized. So we have divisions that are mo almost match ministries. So I'm part of the urban um, housing and and urban development division, but there is another division which is the rural division. Um, they work in all these issues. Uh, we have not been very effective, as governments are not very effective in 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 working together in these in these topics. And I believe we should do it more. Um, and I think should be part of the agenda uh, of the if we want to have a more effective climatic action, it should be part of of certainly it should be part of the of the agenda. But yes, um, uh, it's impossible to see. Uh, I mean, one, one thing is to understand the role of landscape within the city, but it's impossible to do that without understanding what is the footprint of cities in the in the broader landscapes. Um, uh, and absolutely, I, I, I believe that, and, and, and it's not a matter only of subject, it's a matter of what are the tools that uh, we need to provide and we need to use for, for, for engaging into, into those realms. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, my next question is about scales, because I I find quite interesting what you were saying in Barrio 30, you know, about the need uh, from going from the national scale to the to the scale of the cities. But I think there's also a uh, from your point of view, like you've talked about several countries in Latin America, and there are also these all of these regional conversations and when dealing with the issues of the climate crisis and the very green picture like you presented at the beginning. What how do you how do you see the scale of governance at the regional scale and how do you see that like um coming down to the to the scale of the cities and the in the informal settlements. Yeah, that's a very difficult question. It's not a difficult question. It's a question that has a very bad answer, which is, um, and I, and I was trying to articulate it, but uh, it was it was too much maybe uh, within the talk, which is um, the only when you need, so if two th if if two neighborhoods need to get together, you will get the like. Uh, the community leader to speak to the other community leader. If you need two cities to get together to under to, to to just discuss and make an agreement, you will get majors. But if you need a country to uh, discuss and agree something with another country, then you need uh, like or the president or the ministry of the topic. No. Um, so in climate change, what tends to happen 
and also in housing, what tends to happen is that normally what you have is ministries at the national level, which will be Ministry of Housing, Ministry of Environment, and Ministry of Finance, those three together, discussing and signing agreements uh, that then are almost impossible to reach. Uh, and, and those are impossible to reach because the issue of what I, I, I called in the presentation vertical integration, which is, okay, I have the commitment of adapting X number of hectares to the effects of climate change. And then I have an, a commitment of reducing my emissions by 2050 in such and such way. Um, but then who has to do this is not neither the Ministry of Finance or the Ministry of Environment, is the major. And then when the major look at what he has, he normally has a team with very weak capacities because when you move down into the food chain of governance, uh, capacities, capacities tends to be weaker and weaker. Um, and then the, the, the big question is, and, and this is a, and that's why I, I'm saying this is a design challenge. So uh, we need to become in a way um, advocates. We need to be, uh, as designers, we need to do a lot of advocacy in terms of how do we provide solutions in those places for the, for, for the integration to happen. And this can be done in several ways. One is within university providing and thinking about real challenges with this in mind, saying that we know what are the commitments, we know what are the gaps to get into those commitments. Now the question is how do we uh, create solutions that are easily absorbable or uh, easily taken by um, the by the communities, no, uh, or or by 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 the by those that are taking decisions, which are normally somebody sitting in an office uh, in, in a major's office. Um, uh, that that's one thing, but the other is really putting out, putting us out there, going there, going to the events, like speaking with these people. Uh, um, uh, not 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 see, not looking for those sexy projects that are on competitions like worldwide. Trying to go and 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 find projects in places where uh, we will normally won't find them, like small communities. That is where the real challenge will have. I think we need, as designers, we need to articulate our transformations that will be based not in very big gestures, but in micro, in an, in, in the addition of micro, um, micro transformations. And and this is how real governance is um, executed. Real governance that doesn't happen in a table with three people writing and signing a paper. Real governance is how do we, from the place in which we have agency. Um, we um, uh, we uh, we can uh, uh, generate real transformations. Great, thanks for that answer. I think yeah, that basically illustrates the the challenging moments that we have, and you know, it's a great recommendations for uh, students and you know professionals to to focus. Um, uh, just before we open the, the questions to the public, I'll ask you one last question <laughs> from our side. So um, I think there is something that uh, I found interesting. There is this uh, sort of idea that uh, we have to, I guess, formalize what it's informalized. Um, so we can provide uh, you know, services, infrastructure, uh, or you know, social infrastructure as well as you put it, no? So that informal or those informal settlements are part of the formal seat. Uh, and uh, is it possible not to do that? Like for example, I mean, I'm going to illustrate this with a. a I recently visited uh, Oaxaca uh, in Mexico City in an area which is also informal, and I encounter a civil society project which is basically a nursery where uh, there was an effort between the, the community uh, to build a nursery that is, a, a, let's say, self-sustainable. No? So they collect rainwater. Uh, with the roof they have, the solar panels they, they put on top. And, uh, and they put together a, an educational project. And uh, after 15 years, like this is a real project, no? Uh, it kind of is being very successful. And once this, the city 
formal procedure arrive and say, well, uh, we, we want to provide you with a, a water infrastructure so you are connected to the formal city, they basically say, no, thank you. Because <laughs> we have already able to, to provide ourselves uh, with water infrastructure. And this is, I mean, perhaps, you know, the infrastructural side, no? There's also the project, educational project. Uh, and basically what I'm meaning is that, you know, these ideas come from the community, you know, that perhaps uh, they know certain aspects, you know, that perhaps uh, not necessarily experts know. So what is the space, let's say, for that idea, you know, like not being formalized, let's say, in that way, like bringing, you know, the knowledge that already exists from those communities that in some cases have been, well, in most cases have been displaced, you no. Know? And perhaps they could also provide uh, those ideas, no, and to change perhaps from those ideas our idea of formal city. No, there are other networks that can be built, not necessarily the ones that perhaps we build. We think are, uh, you know, the important ones. What do you think on that? So I have two two sorts of answer. One, which is what I believe. The other is what what is happening. Um, I, I will start with what is happening today in the conversation uh, worldwide, uh, no, Latin American wide, which is uh, from having, um, so in the diagram I was showing, uh, what, I, what, what I had was the intervention, so eradication, formalization, integration, and adaptation. But below that, I have the conceptualization of the problem. So eradication was responding to a paradigm by which uh, the problem was illegality. Then um, I think uh, uh, in, uh, formalization it was to, to, when the problem was like the standards of living, and then the other the integration when 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 the problem was um, uh, uh, exclusion and adaptation when the problem would be the environment. Um, while the paradigms behind the intervention in informal settlements are changing, also. Uh, I'll say that the, the big conversation around it is also changing. And today there is a huge movement towards the legitimization of uh, what we are calling the popular economy um, or, uh, or what is happening between uh, popular neighborhoods. And this is also comes from the idea that the, the same the same distinction, the same binary distinction between formal and informal is, is not something that comes from the urban discipline. It comes from economy and it's tied only to who pay taxes and who doesn't pay taxes. And uh, it's completely not operative when we want to have something, when we want to think, use it to think um, uh, about informality or about what we're calling today the, the popular economy. Uh, because uh, it, it neglects everything that happens, every solution that does not fit what the formal CD um, uh, provides. So in those terms, this is, a, this is an ongoing, very articulated process that is leading towards the recognition of other alternative ways to be in the city. Um, and more and more, we are seeing that not that we can, and, I, and by this, I don't want to romanticize what it means to be poor and what it means to live in an informal settlement. What I just want to say is that we don't need to start with the assumption that standardization and um, uh, the homogenization between the modalities of the formal city and the modalities of the informal city should be the answer. Uh, so, so that is what is happening. Then what I believe in my particular like intellectual thought is that we should co be completely radical in those terms. Um, in uh, I think part of what many of the things that we do and that we invest money on are based on consensus that look at the reality through the lenses of uh, what we call formality. And uh, an evidence of this is that when we when we ran the cadastre of informal settlements in Chile, one of the questions was asking people, uh, were you better before being in the slum or are you better at the slum? And these are people that normally Will be living in the in in the formal city in the houses of their parents, and they will say, "No, I'm much better here at the slum." Uh, that tells you something. 
uh and 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 that was and when i say most of the people i'm talking about like the 70 percent of the people saying that they prefer to be at the slum they are not trying to leave the slum there must be something that we need to understand that design as designers and there's much more nuance probably there's much more nuance a set of strategies to engage with um these neighborhoods i i, I believe uh, that are not binary and are not aiming to uh, uh, turn down the dichotomy between um, informal and formal and just like standardize everything towards the side of the formal city. Uh, yeah, I think this answer is related to two questions from the audience. One is um, Sego was asking to what degree are migrants or informal settlement residents involved in the process? And the other question was coming from uh, uh, Jennifer Levy, who worked in Mimbu in the 2019 census for informal settlements. And she was saying that the, um, that the aid that coming from Techo, improving the living conditions, has perpetuated and extended the size of the campamentos. So I think those two questions are related to this aspect that you were covering right now. Could you repeat the first one? The first one is whether the migrants or informal settlement inhabitants are involved in this process. Yes, um, it varies country from country. I mean, uh, I agree with the Techo comment, um, and and that's that's also part of the anxiety, no? Uh, when you feel that you need to provide very quickly a solution, you normally end up providing transitional solutions that aim to be transitional, but actually have only the, the standards of the transitional and have, have the like the image of the transitional, but they ended up being permanent. And this is the same what happened with like, refugee camps that are, are supposed to be there for five years, and then they ended up staying there for 40, 50 years. People live and die in refugee camps. So there is aesthetics of the of the of the of the ephemeral, but actually is the construction of the permanent. So I totally agree with what with that and, and that uh, critique to, to Techo's agency, to Techo's um, activities. Whereas on the other, uh, I believe that changes country from country to country. Um, in um, uh, and, and also, I believe that there are countries that are much more advanced in, 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 in organizing the popular economy uh let's say so argentina for instance is a country where uh the public policy related to uh, uh popular neighborhoods is led by people living in informal settlements my counterpart in argentina was born and raised in a slum uh she is a secretary of uh uh, housing that, that I have to negotiate everything I do and there are all these social movements and then solutions come from uh, from the bottom and it's very interesting because they have forced us to do many things that we thought were impossible uh, in terms of how to for instance today in Argentina when we do projects uh, we do it through uh, cooperatives that are from the same neighborhoods so we're not hiring we're not many times we don't hire uh, like a construction company we hire neighbors and we train them and they do it and so the money stays in the same in the same neighborhood and then the whole risk that we will normally think uh, that is like uh, the quality won't be ex very good or there's going to be a lot of like um, like money will disappear nothing happens nothing happens so it's also I think people, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a battleground, if you want to put it in that way. I think people from the, uh, the um, popular uh, economy need, really need to uh, bring, organize and really need to um, find their space and they really need to uh, um, increase the power they have in decision making and and when we look at the numbers i was giving you if you have the 20 percent of the lat of latin america living in informal settlements it's just a matter of organization if they want to have more uh voice in what needs to happen argentina understood that very very well and they are doing great things 
well, what an interesting example. Um, there's another question from Reshma, and she's asking how can students, design students, prepare or study um, to provide that kind of agency solutions within the three realms you were proposing, the technical, the political, and theoretical? Um, I always tell this to my students, which is, when we when we enter the school, we think that we will end up uh, in front of a computer designing a plan, and and that's more or less what a designer uh, thinks, what we think a designer should do. And I believe designers of the future should be doing very different things. I'm a designer, uh, I, I but I'm sitting every day in the table in which an economist will be sitting. Uh, but I do design work. I do design. I will. I do a different design work. So my my advice will be. It's not just about training, it's about learning by doing. It's about having the aspiration of conquering spaces of power. After, after the modern movement, after what happens in the, in, in the 60s, designers like planners, urban designers, not yet landscape architects, but this will happen in the near future, really were like really active and prominent in, in big conversations. They were not called at the end of the of the discussion they will they will call they will be called at the very beginning of the conversation now what's happening when design became a commod a commodity when we all designers start thinking that our role was actually getting a commission and then design the most beautiful building that we could design uh and and that took us apart from the table in which decision were taken our agency reduced and reduced more more and more so my advice is Try to be, try to find the space to be at the very, from very early in the process while you're a student, try to identify what will be a fantastic space to be at the, at the, when decisions are taken and don't be afraid of doing something that doesn't look like the work, the work of a designer. You will still be a designer from the place in which you are, and you will have also the opportunity to, as a designer, to change institution and to change the world in a much more impactful way but what you will do uh, otherwise. I think it was such a great question and such a great answer that I think it's uh, really good to finish. Yeah, thank you very much, Felipe. Very it's fine. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. Yeah, great, great talk and questions. And yeah, great to hear from you and your ideas. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. It's a pleasure. Nothing of what we we are doing wouldn't have been possible with, with the work of you and your team and, and these fantastic conversations and collaborations we have had in the last five years. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you to all three of you for such an interesting conversation. And Felipe, next time we hope to invite you to be in person at the AA.